Five days of rain sent rivers and streams over their banks in parts of western Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Virginia today, forcing thousands out of their homes into evacuation shelters. Property losses are heavy, and the worst is not over yet in many towns and on the rivers right here in the Pittsburgh area. From Channel 4, WTAE-TV in Pittsburgh, this is Action News. Good evening. Heavy rains have spelled disaster for an all awful lot of people tonight. Thousands of people in southwestern Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Virginia have been forced from their homes by flooding and high waters. Well, police and fire departments and emergency rescue teams are working around the clock to help those who've been forced to seek higher ground because of the flood waters. The hardest hit communities are in Fayette and Somerset counties, and severe flooding is also reported in Green, Westmoreland, and Washington counties. This is the town of Point Marion in Fayette County, near the West Virginia border, where more than 500 people have been forced to evacuate their homes, and most of the downtown area in Point Marion is underwater tonight. And crews are working around the clock here in Fayette City, where the floodwaters caught many residents off guard, and crews have been working all day to get flood victims to higher ground and emergency shelters. And this is Myersdale in Somerset County, where the Flogarty Creek ran over its banks last night. Firemen with loudspeakers warned residents to leave their homes. Several roads in the area are still underwater, and a flood control pond is filled to capacity. Later today, about 20 barges broke loose from the moorings of the Clareton Coke Works of U.S. Steel. Now, the major concern of the Coast Guard was where the barges would drift on the Mon River. So far, several hours, uh, for several hours, more than half a dozen bridges in the area were shut down. Those bridges have since reopened, and Deborah Fox has more in this live report. Deb? Don, as you can imagine, the Mon River was an absolute mess this afternoon, but we are happy to report the situation is all under control. But during the height of all this confusion, when all the barges were making their way down the Mon River, a total of eight bridges had to be closed down, and that caused massive traffic he headaches all over the area. <laughs> Reports are 30 to 40 barges broke loose from different docking facilities along the Mon River. 15 to 20 of those barges came from U.S. Steel's Clareton Works. The barges contain no hazardous chemicals. Most of them are carrying coal and creosote. Some of the questions that come to mind is how dangerous is a situation like this and what can be done about it? Well, we went to the Army Corps of Engineers for the answers. Right now, we can do very little but monitor the situation, watch you know, from whatever vantage point that we can get, uh, how the barges proceed downriver. With the current conditions out there in the Mon River, it would be extremely hazardous for someone to go out and try and retrieve the barges as they're coming downriver. Uh, I think the biggest danger is sustaining some damage to things like bridge piers, uh, possibly some damage at our locks. Uh, generally, with this high flow, you know, we're just allowing the barges to go right by our facilities, go over or through the uh, navigation dams and proceed on down river but generally for most people this is no immediate threat the loose barges provided headaches for various municipalities along the mon river it was the municipalities that had to decide whether to close down bridges and many did close this afternoon police had to shut down the duquesne homestead and glenwood bridges tying up traffic for miles the elizabeth mansfield and rankin bridges were confined to limited traffic now in the city of pittsburgh pendot and the police decide whether a bridge should be closed if a bridge is closed in the city, PennDOT will hire consultants to inspect the bridge and determine if it is safe to reopen. And for a while, the city had to close down some of the city bridges, or PennDOT, I should say, had to close down some of those city bridges. They are Birmingham, Liberty, Smithfield, 10th Street, Glenwood, and Homestead high-level bridges. They are all reopened now. There is no problem whatsoever there. Now, all the barges have been corralled except for one, and that is heading down the Ohio River toward Neville Island. The Coast Guard doesn't think there's going to be much of a problem there. So the situation is all under control. All the bridges have been reopened. Don? Then what is the status of the Gateway Clipper fleet at this hour? Uh, Don, when the Gateway Clipper looked as if it was in some sort of threat here with all of the bridges making, or all of the barges making their way down the Mon River, then the Gateway Clipper was moved to the Allegheny River, so it is safe and sound. Okay, thanks, Deborah. Uh, live downtown. 
As bad as the flooding in Pittsburgh area was today, it was much worse to the south. More than 500 people... Thanks from Chopper Left Carolinas and moved to the northeast. This is a storm located just northeast of Baltimore, Washington, that is providing and has provided all the rain. We were talking about earlier Jack Salvatore in the uh, Cheat River Basin area. Well, they've picked up in excess of seven to eight inches of rainfall in less than a two-day period. But now, as you can see, this area separates the steady rain from the showers. Pittsburgh is now in the shower activity, and the steady rain and heavier rain is to the north. But as the low continues to move north, you can see via the satellite that it's still swirling around the uh, storm center itself with clouds coming back down from the Great Lakes into our area and then other storms moving off from Virginia northward going up in through New Jersey and the New York State area. Heaviest rain right now is up north and looking at our, our uh, latest on Skywatch 4, National Weather Service radar at Greater Pitt, we have some bands of light showers but as you can see it's not throughout the entire area. Right now they're just scattered showers. This is going to be the case. As the low moves to the north, these showers will provide Pittsburgh in the tri-state area and south with no more than a tenth or two tenths of an inch over the next 12-hour period. I'll have additional details later in the news. Now back to Paul. Okay, Joe, thank you. 20 miles north of Point Mary in Pennsylvania, 500 people were forced from their homes in Fayette City. Reporter Stu Emery and photographer Spencer Simon got into the town by four-wheel drive vehicle, but they had to get out a few hours later by boat. Here is their report. It was 3 a.m. when the residents of Fayette City knew they were in trouble. The waters came up quickly, at one point, four and a half feet in only one hour. But the real panic came a little afternoon when word came down the Cheat River Dam had broken. The dam up at the uh, Cheat Lake has broke. You know that for sure, or is that just a rumor? No, that's for sure. It turned out that report was false, but it took more than a half hour to determine that, and in the meantime, there was some panic, and the evacuation process was speeded up. You are ordered to stay out of the area that is designated flood area. Hundreds of volunteer firemen from surrounding communities came to the aid of Fayette City's own volunteers. Hey, Jim, we're going to have to shut this base down to get these radios out here. I'm going to need a boat over here. Okay, 10-4. There was high praise from the townspeople for the quick and efficient job the firefighters did in getting some 400 residents whose homes were affected by the high water out safely. I haven't seen high water before. But everybody got out okay. Everybody's out. Oh, yeah, they've been out. They've been out of the house, even the son's rabbit. <laughs> By mid-afternoon, the waters were still rising in Fayette City, and homeowners were wondering when the river would crest and when they could return to their homes to assess the damage and begin the cleanup. The only good news, there were no known serious injuries or loss of life. Stu Emery, Channel 4 Action News. Well, the worst may not be over yet along Pittsburgh's rivers tonight. Adam Lynch has been keeping a close eye on the rivers from Skycam 4. He's here now with this late live report. Adam? Thank you, Don. We're uh, just a little above 1,500 feet right at the present time. We have not been in any heavy, heavy, heavy rain since we got up here, but uh, we have been flying in and out of showers. As a matter of fact, we're going into a light shower right now, so uh, obviously that weather circumstance continues to uh, precip all over the area, and that uh, doesn't make it any better. They closed the Mon Wharf some hours ago today, and then just about 5.45 they closed the uh, 10th Street Bypass, they expect the waters at the point to crest in the morning at just one foot above flood stage. However, that would still be one foot, they think, below that new wall that they put in on the parkway east. So they're hoping to be able to maintain that parkway underpass in uh, the morning and let rush hour traffic get through there. There have been some horrendous problems at the locks and dams on the Mon. We have been told, for example, at the Maxwell Lock and Dam near Brownsville, the river is already at 41 feet. That's nine feet above flood stage there. Two barges have been sunk there, and another one is now wedged in a chamber at that particular dam. At lock number four, that's at North Chaleroy. The uh, crest is expected to hit at about 40 feet tonight, around 10 o'clock. That would be 14 feet above flood stage, and as you can see from these videotapes that were taken earlier, the dam itself was already obliterated. The water was clear over the top and you couldn't even see it. At
Thank you. 20 miles north of Point Marion, Pennsylvania, 500 people were forced from their homes in Fayette City. Reporter Stu Emery and photographer Spencer Simon got into the town by four-wheel drive vehicle, but they had to get out a few hours later by boat. Here is their report. It was 3 a.m. when the residents of Fayette City knew they were in trouble. The waters came up quickly, at one point four and a half feet in only one hour. But the real panic came a little after noon when word came down the Cheat River Dam had broken. The dam up at the uh, Cheat Lake has broke. Do you know that for sure or is that just a rumor? No, that's for sure. It turned out that report was false, but it took more than a half hour to determine that, and in the meantime, there was some panic and the evacuation process was speeded up. You are ordered to stay out of the area that is designated flood area. Hundreds of volunteer firemen from surrounding communities came to the aid of Fayette City's own volunteers. Hey Jim, we're gonna have to shut this base down to get these radios out here. I'm gonna need a boat over here. Okay, 10-4. There was high praise from the townspeople for the quick and efficient job the firefighters did in getting some 400 residents whose homes were affected by the high water out safely. I haven't seen high water before. But everybody got out okay. Everybody's out, oh yeah, they've been out. They've been out of the house, even the sun's rabbit. <laughs> By mid-afternoon, the waters were still rising in Fayette City, and homeowners were wondering when the river would crest and when they could return to their homes to assess the damage and begin the cleanup. The only good news, there were no known serious injuries or loss of life. Stu Emery, Channel 4 Action News. Well, the worst may not be over yet along Pittsburgh's rivers tonight. Adam Lynch has been keeping a close eye on the rivers from SkyCam 4. He's here now with this late live report. Adam? Thank you, Don. We're uh, just a little above 1,500 feet right at the present time. We have not been in any heavy, heavy rain since we got up here, but uh, we have been flying in and out of showers. As a matter of fact, we're going into a light shower right now, so uh, obviously that weather circumstance continues to uh, precip all over the area, and that uh, doesn't make it any better. They closed the Mon Wharf some hours ago today, and then just about 5.45, they closed the uh, 10th Street Bypass, they expect the waters at the point to crest in the morning at just one foot above flood stage. However, that would still be one foot, they think, below that new wall that they put in on the parkway east. So they're hoping to be able to maintain that parkway underpass in uh, the morning and let rush hour traffic get through there. There have been some horrendous problems at the locks and dams on the Mon. We have been told, for example, at the Maxwell Lock and Dam near Brownsville, the river is already at 41 feet. That's nine feet above flood stage there. Two barges have been sunk there, and another one is now wedged in a chamber at that particular dam. At lock number four, that's at North Charleroi. The uh, crest is expected to hit at about 40 feet tonight, around 10 o'clock. That would be 14 feet above flood stage, and as you can see from these videotapes that were taken earlier, the dam itself was already obliterated. The water was clear over the top and you couldn't even see it. At lock two at Braddock, expected to hit 26 feet in the morning. That would be seven feet above flood stage. Several barges, they tell me, are jammed there and another one has been sunk. So even after the water goes down, they're still going to have some tremendous problems at these locks and dams, getting these various barges that are either sunk or jammed into the, uh, into the dams and locks themselves, trying to get them out. They tell us they expect to know by 7.30 tonight a little better idea of how much water is going to go down the Ohio River and where those crests will come and when they will come. So we're, uh, we're certainly, Don, uh, not to the worst of this yet. It's still going to be a problem for many hours to come. Uh, Adam, we know that uh, 900 people or so have been evacuated in Somerset and Fayette counties. Can you add to that list uh, in the area that you're flying over right now? Well, I've been gathering information on uh, where places have been set up for people to get in. Uh, the Red Cross has set up a, uh, an evacuation center or a uh, center where people who have been evacuated can get in at Allenport, uh, Fredericktown, at Greensboro, at Point Marion, as you saw earlier in the uh, live report with Jack, also at Morgantown, West Virginia, and uh, 
The Salvation Army has placed volunteers in Masontown, Brownsville, and West Brownsville, so all over the areas where the water is up, the Red Cross and or the Salvation Army are moving in, and they are helping people as quickly as they can. Okay, thanks, Adam, very much. Live in Skycam 4, and of course, the worst yet to come with the Ohio expected to crest at 26 feet at one foot above flood stage at uh, 5 o'clock tomorrow morning. Of course, we'll keep you up to date on the flooding situation throughout the night right here on Action News. The entire National Guard force has been activated in West Virginia tonight. 33 counties in that state have been declared disaster areas because of flooding. Bridges have been knocked out, roads are washed out, and thousands of residents have been forced from their homes in hundreds of communities. And at least eight people have been killed by floodwaters in Virginia. Cascading floodwaters forced thousands in the Roanoke and Richmond areas from their homes. Officials say it is the worst flooding to hit that state in many years. Now tonight, the American Red Cross has begun accepting donations for flood victims in the area. If you'd like to help out, send what you can to this address. The American Red Cross, Post Office Box 1769, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 15230. Well, the rains kept a lot of voters away from the polls this election day. We'll take a look at who is running and who is likely to win. When yeah. you, thanks. Earlier in this broadcast tonight, we heard from Jack Salvatore, who's in Point Marion in Fayette County, one of the area's hardest hit by the flooding. Now Jack joins us again live from Point Marion by a new Star 4 satellite. Jack, what is the situation down there now? Well, Don, uh, we have somebody here who can tell us exactly what the situation is. We have the fire chief for Point Marion, a man who's been coordinating the emergency efforts here, Arch Strimmel. Mr. Strimmel, where do we stand right now? Well, right now we're standing a uh, waiting game. We're waiting to see if the river will crest which uh, best estimates from the Corps of Engineers and other people is approximately 8 o'clock tonight. In other words, we haven't seen the maximum height of the river as yet, according to estimates? Well, according to estimates, but uh, one strange thing is happening. The river has receded a little in the last hour, so hopefully it is already crested and it is starting down. If it goes up any further, what do you think might happen? You know, just more destruction that we have right now. We, we you know, most of the downtown area is completely destroyed, uh, you know, water just come up a little bit higher. Now, when we were down there earlier, we saw the uh, railroad bridge and the Route 119 bridge. The water was pretty close to going over the top of those bridges. It didn't look like it could take much more. Do you think it can? Well, you know, there, there again, we really don't know. We've never run into this situation before, as long as I can remember. Uh, it's possible that it could cause severe damage to the bridge and then you know if it gets up into the superstructure they'll have to inspect the bridges before we can use them again. Okay thanks very much Mr. Strimmel. That's Arch Strimmel, the fire chief in Point Marion Don saying as we all do that the hopes that the cresting of the river has already happened and that it's not going to get any higher. Reporting live from Port, uh, Point uh, Marion, Jack Salvatore sending it back to you Don. Okay thank you Jack. Of course we'll have more live reports on the flooding throughout the night via the New Star 4 satellite. Stay with us. This can be taken as a true sign of the times. After four days of steady rain, the inevitable happened. The floodgates opened up and there's more to come. From Channel 4, WTAE-TV in Pittsburgh, this is Action News. Good evening. Tonight, Governor Thornburg has declared five southwestern Pennsylvania counties disaster areas, Don. Well, Paul, the governor has also dispatched more than 700 National Guardsmen to communities that have been devastated by the floods. Hardest hit were those in Fayette and Somerset counties, the dark blue areas on this map. Rivers and creeks overran their banks in Westmoreland, Green, Washington, and Allegheny counties as well. Tonight, more than 1,500 people are spending the night in evacuation shelters after being forced to flee their homes. Perhaps nowhere was the speed, the fury, and the extent of the flooding more vivid than the small community of Fayette City in Fayette County, where our Stu Emery had to be trucked in and had to take a boat to get out. When the residents of Fayette City knew they were in trouble, the waters came up quickly. At one point, four and a half feet in only one hour. But the real panic came a little afternoon when word came down the Cheat River Dam had broken. It turned out that report was false, but it took more than a half hour to determine that, and in the meantime, there was some panic, and the evacuation process was speeded up. You are ordered to stay out of the area that is designated flood area.
hundreds of volunteer firemen from surrounding communities came to the aid of Fayette City's own volunteers. Hey, Jim, we're going to have to shut this base down to get these radios out here. I'm going to need a boat over here. Okay, 10-4. There was high praise from the townspeople for the quick and efficient job the firefighters did in getting some 400 residents whose homes were affected by the high water out safely. I haven't seen high water before. But everybody got out okay. Everybody's out. Oh, yeah, they've been out. They've been out of the house, even my son's rabbit. <laughs> by mid-afternoon, the waters were still rising in Fayette City, and homeowners were wondering when the river would crest and when they could return to their homes to assess the damage and begin the cleanup. The only good news, there were no known serious injuries or loss of life. Stu Emery, Channel 4 Action News. Not even downtown Pittsburgh is exempt from the floodwaters. This is a live picture of the three rivers at Point State Park just a short time ago. The waters made their way over the flood walls and is lapping now at the parkway. The parkway underpass has been closed because of the waters. Earlier today, there was another problem on the rivers. Loose barges, 20 of them broken loose from their moorings and they became mobile hazards to navigation and all the bridges in their paths. Debbie Fox has more on that story. Reports are 30 to 40 barges broke loose from different docking facilities along the Mon River. 15 to 20 of those barges came from U.S. Steel's Clareton Works. The barges contain no hazardous chemicals. Most of them are carrying coal and creosote. Some of the questions that come to mind is how dangerous is a situation like this and what can be done about it? Well, we went to the Army Corps of Engineers for the answers. With the current conditions out there in the Mon River, it would be extremely hazardous for someone to go out and try and retrieve the barges. But generally, for most people, this is no immediate threat. The loose barges provided headaches for various municipalities along the Mon River. It was the municipalities that had to decide whether to close down bridges, and many did close. This afternoon, police had to shut down the Duquesne, Homestead, and Glenwood bridges, tying up traffic for miles. Deborah Fox, Channel 4 Action News. Now, tonight, the latest word we have is that all the bridges, including those you saw being smashed by the barges, should be open by tomorrow to traffic. But we stress that is as of right now. There will be some closings, of course, but not because of runaway barges. To the south of Pittsburgh tonight, the damage was much worse. Over 500 people have already been evacuated from their homes as water surged over the Maxwell Locks and Dam in Point Marion, where the Monongahela and Cheat Rivers join. Whole neighborhoods were underwater, cutting the town off from the rest of the outside world. Bridges leading in and out were either closed or covered with water. And to make matters worse, schools were not canceled. Many parents found themselves stranded and separated from their own children. Well, tonight the situation in Fayette County is somewhat better, but not by much. Jack Salvatore is in Point Marion tonight. He files this report. There's, this is the worst. Yeah, it'll finish this town. Ron Latier has lived in this small town on the Pennsylvania-West Virginia border all his life. Today, he took us to the high ground in town to show us sites all but the most elderly town residents say they have never seen before. All your downtown's underwater down there from the railroad tracks. Better than half the town's underwater. Spreads back this way as far as you can see. Back here is all underwater from the railroad tracks down. Some of them houses down here, it's up over second story. This is Main Street in Point Marion, Pennsylvania. Normally on a Tuesday afternoon, there would be traffic crowding on the street with the shops. Today, the only traffic, that rowboat that you see. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you right now, if you think I'm gonna take and push you guys all around here, you're crazy. <laughs> It's the same boat Action News found itself in just a few minutes later, surveying the devastation from water level. We're getting everything coming down both ways, through the Cheat and the Mon. The water in some places seven to eight feet high. This Foodland supermarket not doing much business today, despite an offer of free parking. But a greater concern, this railroad bridge with the Mon River threatening to flow over the tracks. We're told the normal river flow is 30 to 40 feet below this bridge. Jack Salvatore, Channel 4 Action News. Now in the lower Mon Valley tonight, the problem is the river. It's cresting right now in Charleroi at 44 feet. That is 18 feet above flood stage, the highest in Charleroi in 50 years. Nan Chapman was in the lower Mon Valley tonight, and even the old timers decided it was time to leave. Well, the river came up, and the water started to rain, and the water came in from the water street and washed up on her porch and into the house, and it got up onto the first floor, and the fireman came and asked us to come out. 
We didn't have any choice. We just had to leave. So. Pee Wee's okay, and so is Alice. Alice Worcester and her brother Carl are just two of hundreds of people evacuated from the banks of the Mon today. These people are at the Hiller Fire Department, one of four evacuation centers in Brownsville proper. The centers have been moved several times because the waters keep rising. Dunlap Creek, usually ankle deep, is 20 feet high in Brownsville tonight. This woman lost whatever she couldn't carry out of her hardware store. About 12 noon, the firemen came in and the um, police and shut my lights and electric off. And in 15 minutes, it was up to our ankles. In about an hour, it was up to our waist. The local fire and police departments are working around the clock. The National Guard has been called out to Washington County, but they haven't gotten here yet. Well, I wasn't scared until I got up to the... Uh, church, Christian churches, and I start getting a headache and I got nervous then. They say the river's crested here, but the Brownsville police don't believe it. They say the water goes down six inches, but then it goes back up another eight inches. It'll be well into tomorrow before folks know when they can get back into their homes. Nan Chapman, Channel 4 Action News. Joe DiNardo's been tracking the storm system all day and keeping an eye on the riverfront situation. He joins us now with the very latest. Joe? There are still many tonight still unaware of the damage to their homes because they were forced to evacuate earlier in the day. Many people are staying with friends and relatives and others, as Sally Wigan reports, found refuge at a disaster relief shelter. So watch this step when you get down here. In a natural disaster, where there are victims, inevitably there are volunteers. And without the generous efforts of these Red Cross workers, two elderly Belvernon residents would be completely alone. My sister tried to come over to get me. They wouldn't allow her over the bridge. The water was all over. Spears. She lives around Spears, and it was all water around there. She couldn't make it. I called her at 7. It was four steps high. Unlike Adelmina Schmidt, Janet Hammer has a relative to stay with tonight. And although her own Fayette City home is practically immersed in the dark floodwaters, she is unselfishly turning her attention to others here. Doing whatever I can to help out other people that don't have a place to go. Leave Ted here now and then take the rest of the Fayette City. Distributing cots to the different shelters became a chief concern tonight, but when volunteers showed up at the Fayette City Community Center, no flood victims were there. Most had found friends living on higher ground to stay with, but they couldn't seem to tear themselves away from the river that had taken over their homes. Friends of mine has a big farm, and he also came in with his men from the farm and moved all the furniture off the first floor up to the second floor. This is the worst flood that we've ever had, as far as I know, in the history of the Monongahela Valley. And most of these people don't have flood insurance. They say it's too expensive for one thing, and for another thing, they never expected the waters to get this high. So in the next couple of days, they are left with just going back to their homes, cleaning up, and trying to make do. Sally Wigan, Channel 4 Action News. Later on Action News, we'll have more on the weather situation. But when we come back, we'll shift our... TV in Pittsburgh. This is Action News. Good evening. This is the worst flooding to hit southwestern Pennsylvania in a very long time. And today, massive cleanup operations are underway. Don? Before more than 1,800 people were forced to evacuate their homes yesterday by the flooding, and today, their neighbors and friends are pitching in to help out in any way they can. Governor Dick Thornburg has declared five southwestern Pennsylvania counties disaster areas, and more than a million dollars in state and federal aid will be used to help the victims. The governor toured flood-stricken areas in Brownsville and West Brownsville today, assessing the damage. Additional funds will be needed to help residents, and the governor promised to do all he could to help out. Cleanup crews have their work cut out for them tonight. Even with the help of 700 National Guard troops, it'll be weeks before many towns in our area are back to normal. The floodwaters not only damaged homes and businesses, but washed out roads and bridges as well. And in North Charleroi, the first flood-related fatality has been reported. Stu Emery has details. Residents of communities like West Brownsville were relieved this morning to see the floodwaters had finally begun to recede, but there were still more than 100 homes with water covering their first floors. Only a few families were able to save anything. The water just came up too fast at 1.4 and a half feet in one hour. We're on Main Street in West Brownsville, and it's, we had eight inches of water on our first floor. It's never been up that high in the 34 years I've been in this town. I've never seen this water clump as fast. I walked down to my brother's place down there, 
across Middle Street in just a regular pair of shoes, and I, can, I couldn't get back across. Many residents unwilling to wait for the waters to go down used boats to get to their homes. What they found was heartbreaking. Yeah. Real. Water's up, was up to here. Got two microwaves. All of four in the kitchen's all fucking. Turn the refrigerator over. Downstream in North Charleroi, the first flood-caused fatality was discovered when relatives of 38-year-old Leo Kelly returned to their home to find his body, the apparent victim of a flood-caused gas leak. In California, tons of mud had to be washed from city streets, and California University reported a million dollars in damage to a computer and to an electronic microscope. In California and in most areas, security was a concern. We were concerned about uh, residents' uh, homes being uh, uh, ransacked or looted, and now with the National Guard here, we can breathe easy on that. So I, that's the best I can say. It's really a tragic event, but uh, we're doing the best we can under the circumstances. Though there's more than enough muddy water, drinking water is in short supply in Charleroi and Denora, and in Elko, Stockdale, Roscoe, and Allenport, there's no drinking water at all. Officials hope to have that problem corrected within a few days. Getting the flooded communities back to normal will take considerably longer. Stu Emery, Channel 4 Action News. Many old-timers in West Virginia and southwestern Pennsylvania say the current flooding is worse than the big flood of 1936, at least in their areas. At the same time, many are asking the question, why did the Monongahela River take the brunt of the storm? Deborah Fox has some answers now in this live report from Point State Park. Deb? Well, Don, the answers are quite simple. The Mon River just got more rainfall than the other rivers, and it is also a smaller river than, let's say, the Ohio, and they can't handle as much water. And uh, the Mon River Basin certainly got a tremendous amount of water in the last few days. The Mon River begins to form 128 miles south of Pittsburgh in Fairmont, West Virginia. It has the distinction of being the only river in the country to flow north. And when the rains hit these past few days, they hit the Mon River so much harder than the Ohio or the Allegheny. Right across this area here. And seven inches occurred right here, uh -huh. right down here. Seven inches in less than 24 hours. The Ohio is a much larger river than the Mon, and the amount of rainfall that fell on the Ohio was three times less than what fell on the Monongahela. Still, the heavy rains pounded the Ohio enough to cause some minor flooding. Crest now uh, is going down to Ohio. It, was in, it passed through Pittsburgh at 5 o'clock this morning. The river at the point crested at 26.2 feet. Now it is falling. That crest is moving down to Ohio. It will be down to Weaving, West Virginia around 10 o'clock tonight. There will be only minor flooding in lowland areas along that route. Our meteorologist, Joe DiNardo, says we were fortunate in Pittsburgh that the rains did not hit the Mon and Allegheny River Basin simultaneously. Had the Allegheny River Basin up north received the same type of rainfall, then you would have had the Allegheny River flowing to the point the same as the Mon was on a rapid rise, and the city of Pittsburgh, Allegheny County, and the point could have been devastated down there had that occurred both simultaneously from the Mon Basin and the Allegheny River Basin. According to the river forecast and also how quickly PennDOT can clean up the parkway, the parkway should reopen tomorrow, the 10th Street bypass on Friday, and the Mon Wharf on Monday. But I should preface that by how quickly the waters receded and also how quickly PennDOT can clean up all the mess on the parkway. Don? Deb, what does the, the point look like from your perspective right now? Well, from my perspective right now, it doesn't look too good. It really doesn't look as if the waters have gone down any since this morning, but I'm told that uh, each hour the waters are receding. For instance, uh, I believe that the waters are at 23 feet, flood stage is at 25 feet, and uh, the waters at the point have gone down four inches since four o'clock. So although it doesn't look it, they are receding, and that's a very good sign. Okay, thanks, uh, Deborah Fox, live at Point State Park. Well, the high water will cause some serious problems for motorists trying to get into downtown Pittsburgh tonight and maybe tomorrow. PennDOT, meantime, is doing all it can to alleviate some of the problems on the Parkway Central. Jack Salvatore is live downtown with this update. Jack? It is Pittsburgh's version of the reflecting pool in Washington, D.C. A quarter mile of placid, almost beautiful water. The problem is, there is supposed to be a parkway here, a brand new parkway. But it is designed to uh, accommodate approximately a flood every uh, fifth year on a historical sequence basis. 
Uh, that's not to say you can't get two year uh, floods uh, back to back. But four and a half days of steady rains were more than an even match for the new improved wall, requiring PennDOT to do something it would rather not have had to do a scant few days after the parkway's long awaited opening. I believe the flood wall that we built down there is six foot high, which is a little more than four foot higher than the previous flood wall. So in essence, we kept the parkway open a longer period of time uh, before the water got up to the top. Uh, predictions that we had on the uh, flood basically were it would crest at about 26 uh, feet, plus or minus a half a foot. Actually, the crest came at a uh, greater than 27 feet, uh, more than a foot above the current flood wall. Well, we are here now at the Parkway underpass here, and there's so much for the bad news that you just heard. The good news is that PennDOT is here at this moment pumping the water out that you see that is accumulated here. They say that process will be completed by 11 o'clock tonight. That will be followed by a cleanup process that is expected to last until morning. And the real good news, Don, is that PennDOT says that this uh, freeway here is going to be open for rush hour tomorrow morning. Uh, Jack, as you know, the Pendots had more than a share of problems with the parkway. It's a question of bad planning or bad luck or both. Don, if you want to know what Pendot's explanation is right now, they're blaming it on Haley's Comet, the Fort Pitt Tunnel fire and this, and they say that they think Haley's Comet has something to do with it, and that's just as good an explanation as anything else I've heard. Okay, Jack, thank you very much. Yesterday's floods caused some other problems in the downtown area. The heating systems in many downtown center city office buildings are not working tonight because the high water damaged steam pipes and the ducts that are part of the systems. Crews are working around the clock to repair the damage. And as the floodwaters recede, the massive cleanup job begins. We have reports tonight from Sally Wigan in Point Marion and Kathy Milton in McKeesport. Today, the rivers had retreated from Point Marion, but not without leaving their slimy calling card. Where there was water, there is now mud. Can you see? Well, I don't, I don't want to fall. Eleanor Lecky was rescued from this home by a boat yesterday. She stayed overnight with her son in Uniontown, and this afternoon returned to this. Look at those drapes. You knew it was up that far? Oh, that's my daughter that got killed. Oh, my God. Thank God it's not hurt. And today, Mrs. Lecky has no husband to console her. He died May the 29th with cancer very bad what are you going to do I don't know I don't know Mrs. Letke's home is on Water Street the street is called that because it overlooks the river but today that name was a cruel joke but no one is laughing this tiny town of 1400 people has suffered well over a million dollars in damages and Point Marion just can't afford that. There is little industry here, and a number of stores were going out of business even before the Cheat and Mon Rivers overflowed their banks. This store is finished completely. It'll, it won't reopen. It, uh, there, nobody will come in as a retail store at this time, no. The National Guard still has cordoned off an eight-block area of the town. Business and homeowners were allowed into the area for only half-hour stretches. Once we have closed, uh, the damage is uh, terrific and uh, We've got to really inspect those places to let those people back in there. In the meantime, PennDOT and utility crews began the messy task of mopping up and trying to restore things to normal in the next couple of days. But normal may be a long way off for many of these people. Mrs. Leckie, for one, says she will never live near water again. Seven years ago, McKeesport installed a wall in flood-proof storm drains that officials felt would protect the city against what they're experiencing at this hour, a serious flood. Even so, McKeesport is luckier than most cities in the Mon Valley area. Flooding has been confined to water in the basements of homes and businesses in the downtown area. Most of the problems have occurred in the fringe areas near the rivers, like Harrison Village, where 140 families had to be evacuated. Came around the police and knocked on everybody's door and told them to leave Harrison Village right away and that's what we all did you know they had to have uh, ambulance and everything to take people out on stretchers wheelchairs and everything you know it may be several weeks before people like Ms. Stinson can return home the public housing complex suffered damage to the boilers and the gas has been turned off Lorraine Nimchek just moved her family to Glassport floodwaters caught her before she even unpacked it's like two steps right now from coming into my living room and dining room upstairs the whole cellar is just completely flooded. 
Emergency disaster services have already moved in to aid the homeless, and lodgings have been set up at the Salvation Army, the YMCA, and several churches. Those who escaped the initial flooding in McKeesport are still not scot-free. They'll have to begin conserving drinking water, and they face a water shortage. It is clean. It is fit to drink. There is no problem with the water. The problem is here at the plant, and it was caused by the high flooding, the high water. Griffith says he doesn't know how long it's going to take them to drain the tank of 600,000 gallons of water. However, the water buffaloes will be coming if there should be a water shortage. Kathy Milton, Channel 4, Action News. And this news just in from McKeesport, the Water Authority says the drainage is going better than expected and the town's water supply could be back to normal as early as tomorrow. The flooding in the mid-Atlantic states has claimed 28 lives so far. West Virginia was especially hard hit. Today, the governor, Arch Moore, declared 33 counties disaster areas. Nan Chapman has more on the story now from Clarksburg in Harrison County. There wasn't anything left. The West Fork River usually meanders peacefully through Clarksburg, West Virginia. It went on a rampage last night. Today, low-lying residents began the awful business of cleaning up. I had a 10 by 12 building, wooden barn-style building, which was down by their swing sets. I did find it about 500 yards down the river. The river here is usually ankle deep, but these houses were submerged up to the roof. Today, friends and relatives helped Julie and Doug Edwards move their waterlogged belongings so they can begin to clean and dry out the house. I got the kids out, two dogs and the cat out. At one point, the river rose as far as this bank, 200 feet away. The water's receding now, but the full realization of how much they lost is just beginning to hit the people who live here. Terrified. I did, you know, you never expect anything. It, it came fast. The people along here have lost everything. No one knows if the houses have suffered any structural damage. Ironically, the Edwards were planning to move, but not quite this way. It's gone, Joe. We might as well take this to the town. Watch your head. Put it back here in the corner. All the way in the corner. Nan Chapman, Channel 4 Action News. About 120 miles to the east of Clarksburg, where the Potomac River meets the Shenandoah, much of the town of Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, is underwater tonight. We have more on the flood situation there from News Star Network reporter Nat Harrington. Don, people here in Harpers Ferry have a little bit of experience with this from 1972 when Hurricane Agnes rose the waters in this area, then back in 1936 as well. There have been no deaths, no serious injuries here. Uh, the tourist industry, as you might well imagine, has come to a screeching halt, and towns in both directions have been evacuated tonight. Rocks, Maryland, on the Virginia-Maryland border. Residents moved their furniture upstairs or to high ground early this morning. A gas station, shops, and homes were flooded, and many displaced families watched in disbelief as the floodwaters continued to rise. Desperate attempts were being made to rescue vehicles and secure buildings as residents prepared to be out of their homes and businesses for at least three weeks. Upriver at historic Harper's Ferry, tourists watched as a man in a pickup truck was stranded in chest-high water when he attempted to drive along a flooded mountainside road. In the main tourist area, businesses closed down and equipment and furniture were moved out to wait out the cresting of the river sometime tonight. Don, we are told that the Shenandoah has already crested or soon to crest moments from now. The Potomac River is going to crest, we are told, about 10 o'clock tonight, some 30 to 35 feet above a flood stage. Don? Okay, thank you very much. Nat Harrington live in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia on our new Star Satellite Network. Paul? By the way, your help is needed for those who have lost everything they owned in this flooding. And area organizations are collecting... For now, a special... Water. Everywhere you look, that's all you see in many communities along the Mon River. But tonight, the worst appears to be over, and cleanup operations are underway. A Channel 11 News special report, The Wake of the Flood. Good evening. The Great Flood of 1985 continues to cause numerous problems tonight, even after the water has begun to recede in many areas. 
But despite the falling water, there are a multitude of problems still facing thousands of people from West Virginia to Point State Park. In place of water, there's mud and other debris, and the cleanup will take days, maybe even weeks. But before we address these issues, we must look back to how it all began, how all the problems started. The devastation caused by the flood of 1985 didn't begin in our area. In fact, it began more than 1,500 miles from the tri-state region in the Gulf of Mexico. It all started as Hurricane Juan, a temperamental storm that blasted the Gulf of Mexico region last week and then began a deadly trek through the mid-Atlantic region and finally into our area. By the time the big storm reached the tri-state region over the weekend, wind wasn't the problem, rain was. It began falling last Friday night, first as a gentle rain, but then as a downpour that refused to stop, as if the heavens had opened. By the time the heavy raid stopped last night, more than 5,000 people had been driven from their homes. Some of the hardest hit areas included Preston and Monongahela counties in West Virginia, where Governor Arch Moore declared several counties disaster areas. There's stuff out now. We've got a whip now. From West Virginia, the misery moved into Pennsylvania. At Point Marion, where the Monongahela River and Cheat Lake formed a disaster duo, the town was virtually isolated. More than 500 people were evacuated. Water was 14 feet deep in the downtown area. We have lost totally all of our business, and we also have lost everything in the downstairs of our home. By now, other areas along the Mon were feeling the brunt of the storm. Fayette City, for example, where virtually the entire population had to be evacuated as the waters rose at the rate of one foot per hour. In fact, in just a short period of time, the entire town was one big lake. The problems continued further up the Mon. By this time, a new piece was added to the puzzle. The location was Clariton, where the raging waters caused about 40 barges to break loose from their moorings at the Clariton works of U.S. Steel and Ingram Steel. While the sight of these hulks of steel floating down the river may have been a curiosity to some, well, it was serious the business to others. Your end of the bridge is cut off, so nobody comes on that bridge. Those barges are shaking the bridge pretty good. One by one, the barges, some loaded with coal, began slamming into bridges. forcing those fans to close until the barges went by. As you might expect, traffic in the region quickly went from free-flowing to a giant parking lot. Now next in the path of the flooding was McKeesport, where the high waters and the Yokogany forced the evacuation of residents in the Harrison Village housing project. No, but I can't swim and I don't know what's going to happen overnight. So I'm getting out now. <laughs> but while there was water everywhere, most of it was not fit to drink. And that caused yet another problem. We, we got some dirty river water into our clear well. Uh, that caused what dirty water. We can't put dirty water out into the system, so we shut down the plant. At the point downtown, the signs of the flooding were everywhere. From the sound of the barges slamming into the Fort Pitt Bridge, to the flooding on the Mon Wharf and 10th Street Bypass. And while the Parkway Central's new retaining wall passed its first test, even it couldn't stop the relentless flow of water, forcing the closing of the recently reopened roadway. From West Virginia to the point, the story was the same. Water, water everywhere. And still ahead on our special report tonight, putting the pieces back together as the region tries to return to normal following the flood of 85. We'll be right back. Tonight, let's take a few minutes to update a couple of major problems that remain in the wake of the flood of 1985. The first is traffic. PennDOT officials say tonight they are working to reopen the Parkway Central area and the 10th Street bypass by tomorrow. But they advise motorists to get the latest information before heading into town in the morning. And of a more serious nature, West Penn Water has issued a boil water alert for Allegheny and Washington counties. And other areas include Robinson Township Water Authority and the North Fayette Water Authority as well. Just a few minutes ago, we spoke with Greg McKelvey from West Penn about the water problem. Anytime you have a high amount of turbidities, you have to be careful about bacteria. And these are the things that we're sampling now on a routine basis, steady pattern, and we're finding that our, our system is improving on the amount of water that's leaving the plant, but we have to give it some more time till we're back to normal levels. Okay, what about the folks who've been drinking this water all day long? Before we made the announcement earlier this evening, you got any advice for those folks tonight? We have no indications from the 
tests that we've run so far that any of the water consumed previous to the boil water would be detrimental. Do you have any idea of when we're going to get an all's clear signal, when this water will be safe to drink without any reservations? Well, Mike, as I mentioned, we are working around the clock, adjusting our treatment, and we're seeing improvement. But we hate to, to stay to any set time right now, but we're hoping, the way things are working, that by Friday, we should be able to lift the boil water. So the water has been receding today in those areas devastated by the flood of 1985, and that means that cleanup efforts are underway. But as Andy Gassmeyer reports, cleaning up does not mean a return to normal. Case in point, Point Marion, one of the hardest hit towns. Life is hardly what you call back to normal in communities ravaged by yesterday's flooding, but the mon is its water's back within the river's banks. Well, almost anyway. So the homes in Point Marion that less than 24 hours ago were totally or partially underwater stand in puddles rather than pools, and like refugees, the victims go back to what once they thought was sacred and leave with what they can salvage stuffed in garbage bags. I consider it all lost. Edith Summerfield and her daughters are returning to their home for the first time since they were evacuated yesterday. Oh, that brand new bed in my organs going. This is my first experience. <laughs> We've lived here about eight years and I've never seen nothing like this. Lewis Eberhardt shows us around the home it took he and his wife a lifetime to piece together. A home ransacked by waters that topple a refrigerator, but curiously leave a candle standing on a dining room table that once was underwater. You see it and you hear about it, but you can't realize what it's like until you get into it. While the National Guard stands watch against looters, efforts are underway to restore vital services. Normalcy, however, is a long way off. It's one thing to wash away the debris and the filth left behind by the flood, but it's quite another, said one victim, to forget any of this anytime soon. People are going to have more problems related to the stress of this loss when they go back down there and look and see what's lost. Andy Gassmeyer, Channel 11. One of the major problems facing cleanup crews is the debris currently floating in the Mon River. There is so much to be done that the Coast Guard and Army Corps of Engineers say the river will be closed at least until Friday afternoon and possibly longer. As Stuart Brown reports, the damage on the Mon will be in the millions. In the 23-mile stretch upstream from the point, as many as 50 pleasure craft have been wrecked or sunk and scores of barges have fallen victim to the runaway waters. There are 62 barges in that zero to 23 mile stretch which were broken away uh, at least a dozen are down and sunk what's it going to take to uh, restore things to normality quite a few days i'm sure it'll stretch into weeks uh, particularly at lock and dam number two on the mon as well as a separate incident up at maxwell lock and dam where there are at least 21 barges against the dam and uh, two or three sunk and down in the approaches to that dam. The local industry, of course, particularly steel, depends heavily on river traffic, and the flood will take its toll on manufacturing. It already hinders and impedes a industry which has been down recently, over the past three, four years. It's no help at all. Stuart Brown, Channel 11 News. It takes more than the work of residents and local officials to clean up the aftermath of the flood of 85, and when we return, we'll talk to two people who are deeply involved in that cleanup process. We'll be right back in just a moment. Please stay with us. Official reaction to the devastation caused by the flood of 1985 is beginning to come in now. Senator Hines has asked Governor Thornburg to expedite the procedures needed to get federal disaster relief into the affected areas. And the senator made plans to tour the flood areas tomorrow. As for Governor Thornburg, he was in the region today. And our Joe Bell was with him. It's questionable how much of the devastation the governor really saw. He toured the area for only 40 minutes by air, but he apparently saw enough. And by this afternoon, he was outlining the steps he's taking to speed the cleanup. I spoke uh, with the White House this morning and alerted uh, them that we would uh, in all likelihood be uh, submitting uh, a request for a federal declaration uh, by the weekend. If the president officially calls Pennsylvania a disaster area, it would be another 10 days to two weeks before emergency claim centers open. That's where flood victims could apply for several types of government aid. Emergency housing in mobile homes, business and personal loans at only 4.8% interest, 
and emergency short-term grants of up to $5,000 per family. The federal government will put up 75% of the cost and uh, local governments 25%, uh, although in, in, in our state, uh, the state uh, has uh, generally picked up that cost. Uh, right now, most of the governor's effort is directed towards sending National Guard units with fresh water tanks into the disaster area. He's also gearing up the insurance and welfare departments to handle claims and sending out transportation department inspectors to check for bridge damage. Only about a million dollars will go to direct cash aid for victims. Victims of last June's tornadoes complained that state and federal agencies were too slow in handling claims. Thornburg says that's just not valid. You don't uh, handle disasters, you respond to them. And uh, your response capability depends upon uh, the type of uh, coordination and the type of experience and expertise that uh, the people who are uh, handling it have. It's a terrible way to learn but it's the only way uh, that you're going to get that experience. And I and experience has taught the state emergency management agency to find out exactly how big the problem is. Tomorrow, their experts, along with teams from Washington, will fan out and assess the damage. They may recommend extending the disaster area to Westmoreland County, as well as the six other counties the governor named last night. It's easy to criticize politicians for showing up at the scene of a disaster and promising aid in vague terms, but right now, the appearance of the governor is something that causes hope among the people of the Midmont Valley. It shows them that at least someone wants to get the ball rolling. Joe Bell, Channel 11 News, Brownsville. Whenever there is an emergency, one of the first groups on the scene to offer support is the Red Cross. The flood of 1985 is no exception, as Red Cross personnel are out in force in many of the communities that have been hardest hit by the flooding. Joining us in our newsroom now is Barry Frazier uh, with the Red Cross. Barry, two things. First of all, welcome. Thanks for being with us tonight. And we would like to commend you. We understand uh, that you've been working real hard. You've been out there three days and nights without any sleep or rest. How are you holding up, Barry? Well, I imagine most of us are, uh, have been used to this before because we, uh, this is our function. What I'd like to say, though, is uh, the staff support that we've been getting from the chapter is, is tremendous. Uh, people that work in other departments have been just pitching in and coming out and saying, hey, what, what do you need us to do? Come on out. We'll, we're going to help you. And the community, I can't say enough about the community of West, uh, West Elizabeth. They've been, they've been just tremendous. In addition to the job that's needed to be done, I'm sure that kind of support kind of pushes you on and makes it just a bit easier for you to do. Definitely. Tell us about where you just came back from, West Elizabeth. What Describe for us, if you will, the scene of, of destruction there by the floodwaters. Okay, uh, yeah, we were just on a scene. Uh, in fact, we came back to sh tonight, and uh, just to give you a, an idea of, of the, the type of water that we're talking about, we took a walk out to uh, the railroad tracks they have that overlooks the... Uh, the devastation and the waters were all the way up to the bottom of a stop sign and uh, up to the front porches of all the all most of the homes in this three block area. What do you figure area. that is Barry? About four or five feet? Oh yeah it has to be that and uh, that's only in the one area that we saw. We're having a little bit of difficulty getting out to do any kind of damage assessment. All right we're having a little difficulty coordinating what you're talking about and what we're seeing so okay. tell us what we're seeing here. Is this one of the relief centers and some of the folks exactly. getting supplies coming in finding shelter? Yeah yeah exactly what you have on there is is the shelter that uh, the Red Cross is set up in conjunction with uh, the people of West Elizabeth and... Uh, How many people do you figure, Barry, are in there tonight? Well, we're talking approximately about uh, 50 to 60 people uh, we've had in the last two days into the shelter. Uh, we saw some folks unloading some boxes. It looked like portable cots and maybe some medical supplies and things there. Give us an idea of what, what other supplies and, and support equipment that the Red Cross might need to help deal with this emergency situation. Okay, right now, just, to, just for the Red Cross, we do, we do have cots, blankets. We have comfort kits for the people in, in the shelters. Uh, we're fairly set on that. I think, uh, I think what we need actually is contributions that can be given in the form of money uh, if people want to give, uh, you know, that kind of uh, help. And they can send any, uh, any contributions to the American Red Cross, Box 1769, Pittsburgh, 15230. Money is the biggest thing right now that we're, we're going to need. Okay. Barry, we've seen all the pictures and, 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 and talked to a lot of people about all of the damage. We've seen what's needed to be done. We've seen the cleanup operations underway. But give us your opinion as someone who has no doubt seen a lot more of this kind of situation, certainly than most of us have. How do people come back from this kind of, 
uh, emergency disaster kind of situation when they know that everything that they have has been lost, that their homes possibly have been wiped away, washed away, and the only thing they have left is what they're wearing on their back. How do they psychologically mentally, if you will, deal with this situation? And does the Red Cross assist in that process? Oh, yes. Well, what, what the situation is, a lot of times people don't realize that haven't been in the situation, that a lot of times they're not, they're not going to deal with it right now, but down the road we're talking, uh, we're talking a kind of a uh, trauma because right now everything's moving around. People are there. Uh, they're taking their minds off. They've got to go back and clean up. They've got to do this, that. So down the road, uh, more or less, uh, they're going to need a lot of help because of the fact that a disaster doesn't affect you right away uh, in a lot of instances. Down the road, say two, three months from now, uh, they're going to need the, uh, the assistance of, of an agency and friends and family. Okay, Barry, uh, thank you very much for taking time to be with us tonight. And I know the folks out there in need of help are certainly glad there are folks like you and your fellow Red Cross workers around to help them out. Thanks for being with us, We Barry. thank you for having us on. You bet. You come back anytime. Okay. Still ahead on our special report tonight, we'll talk to someone who has become quite an expert on flooding. After all, he's seen everyone since 1936. We'll be right back in a moment. It's hard to compare them in terms of human suffering, but in terms of damage, the flooding in the past two days has not been as bad as the big flood of 1936. Back then, there was little or no flood control, leaving area creeks fed by rain and melting snow to flow freely into the Allegheny and Mon rivers. As a result, downtown department stores and other businesses were totally flooded out in 36. With water rushing through the streets, rowboats suddenly became the best form of transportation back then. Today, I found an old-timer who vividly recalls what happened here in Pittsburgh on St. Patrick's Day back in 1936. Joe Barkowski has lived in this Lawrenceville neighborhood for 66 years, right here on 42nd Street since he was 12. He's 78 years old today. Joe's seen a lot of changes. But by his own account, the most significant event of Joe's neighborhood happened 49 years ago, the big flood of 1936. Joe was 29. It started really uh, uh, about March 15th, 16th. And you could see the wet snow. It was heavy rains coming down, heavy snow coming down. And uh, first, all I know, that the waters were rising. How deep was it, would you say? Now, over there, it was as far as deep. Uh, this is how high it was. Talk to Joe Brakowski oh, for just a few minutes, well. and you know he's not the not, kind of guy to just stand right. around and do nothing uh, he was in a disaster. Red Cross and other people came around from the Boys Club, asked us if we could help them. I said, help doing what? He says, you know, there's people down your neighborhood that they want to be taken out of their homes. They're, they're stranded. They don't want to leave the first couple days. So, so Joe volunteered. He and his brother Iggy jumped in a rowboat checking the neighborhood, looking for folks who stayed behind when warned to leave. Those who just didn't think it was going to get as bad as it did. You were just going on up and down the street in a rowboat taking Right in here, yeah. And we had to go in here with the rowboat, right in the hallway here. So he came down the steps and, and uh, he was a big man, heavy man, so we took him out. We took him off to the street and told him to go to Boys Club, because the Boys Club at that time was uh, taking care of them, you know. You came down the street in a rowboat and, and we, went we, inside we, the door, the first right, right. floor, inside of a that is correct. in the rowboat. Right, the that is correct. People. The rescue people, yeah. As the water rose, Joe and his brother went from front door rescues to second story rescues. First, second, third, fourth house there, see? She was on the second floor. Oh, this house right here? Right there. That house over there. So somehow my brother Riggy managed to hold the boats, level it off as I brought her down. She came down to my arm. Gee, I, I, th I thought I'd going down with her, you know. But fortunately, he held the boat up and balanced the boat, and we were able to pull her out. Yesterday, on the river itself, barges busting loose was a major problem. Back in 36, it was something totally different that came roaring down the river. We saw... Uh, this so-called uh, summer home from o Oakmont coming right down with dogs on her, or maybe a cat with a small animal on her with them. And uh, we saw a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of homes coming down. Evidently the waters, the summer homes from around Oakmont area were being yeah. <laughs> floating down the river rather rapidly, too. The threat of a similar event caused by recent rains and flooding was not a pleasant thought for Joe. That's really a torture. It's an emotional experience that you don't care uh, to live through. 
pretty hard to, uh, to go through, you know. I thought combat was tough. Maybe not in the exact same words, but no doubt similar thoughts are going through the minds of thousands of Mon Valley residents, and will for some time to come. So, let's recap where we are tonight. The water is receding in many areas, and the strenuous job of cleaning up is underway. And while the cleanup continues, the new problem with water has many in the region concerned tonight, and rightly so. But one thing we can be thankful for, despite the torrents of water and the devastation it caused, we can be thankful that there has not been more harm done to individuals. Perhaps Joe Brokowski puts it best. You take all that scientific knowledge we have and know-how, and there's not much we can do to... Uh modify the nature's actions. That's a sad part of it. That's our Channel 11 News special report on the flood of 85. We thank you for joining us. And don't forget to stay tuned for Channel 11 for the most complete updates on the flooding and its aftermath. Good night.